The shift is massive. Right now, we have a shift to electric vehicles and then and soon autonomous vehicles. The fourth revolution, connected objects. Connected objects were also very present in Las Vegas. Most importantly, we're turning houses, homes, and and now and other and some other companies have been partners in that uh, into an active part of the energy system. It's just not the smart home. It's the fact that suddenly a home is part of the energy system with flexibility, with information, with storage and generation. Twenty billion. Uh, uh, objects are just about to be uh, connected uh, in the coming year, 20 billion. We're talking about every single object which is being connected. We just invested in a company called Sigfox. Sigfox puts together a telecommunications network uh, with a cost divided by 1,000 to bring in information. And last but not least, the ultimate revolution. And it was mentioned, what do we do in the, in the middle of time? Why, why do we do where we need a lot of energy? Well, there's only one factor that meant it, made it happen. It's liquid or gas. But that li like liquid or gas has a name, it's hydrogen. And we're right now planning, and we will make very impressive, I must say, announcement soon, on how to reach $6 per million BTU, is in this case we're matching with fossil fuels. Six dollars per million BTU, which is roughly the cost of energy for those who are not aware of it. With clean liquid fuel, which can be transported from one part of the planet, which can be stored from one season to another. <coughs> now, if you put all these five revolutions that are coming, they're happening right now. It's a jinker. It's not just the future, it's happening right now. It's changing our business models. And we at Energy present 70 countries with over uh, 100 gigawatts of generation. We're well placed to see that. Uh, the good news is that I'm most of all the countries present here. It's your future. You can take it. Technology is just bringing you this possibility. Good. Uh, what's that leave uh, for us, uh, Thierry, uh, as natural gas as a transition <coughs> fuel then? I know Angie's. Uh, very active in the gas space as well. Go ahead and follow up. And I'd love to hear from others as well uh, from the private sector. What, what happens? Uh, very, many people get very excited about natural gas and, and its own market being developed outside of oil. How does this fit into your equation at NG? Uh, still, I know you're a, a big supplier. I, I think you mentioned the word transition. It's a transition. Now, the question is do you want? Transition is from point A to point B. We know where we are. We know where we're going. The only question is how fast. And honestly, I would not prefer personally to be stuck in the transition. I'd right? rather to go as fast as possible to the end point. Let me uh, drill down a little bit with you and I invite the other members of the private sector to jump in. Say on Mozambique, which is represented here, or Tanzania, uh, made big, big, big natural gas discoveries. Uh, potentially to fuel their future and not go into the spaces that you're uh, suggesting here. <coughs> Anybody of my four in the private sector there, please jump in. What would you advise countries that have made these big discoveries? Are they transition fuels or can you live off it and regionally disperse that energy for the next 30 to 40 years? I, I think uh, all our analysis shows that you cannot green uh, your energy system very rapidly without having a very potent gas system too, because you have to really think your system together. So the power system has to be linked together, thought together with the, with the gas system and the transport system and the cooling heat system. All the system has to work together, and a strong gas system is important. Then you can green your gas system over the years, and we, many countries are well underway in greening their, their gas system, either by biogas or hydrogen or a mixture of the different uh, different sources. But without a potent, a potent, very strong gas system, it would be too expensive to, to, to accelerate this, this green conversion. That's so, important. Do you agree with Thierry, though, that it is a transition fuel? I'll, I'll bring in Irene as well. It, it is a transition fuel, yes. Okay. Uh, Irene? Stand oil, known as a major oil producer of Norway, developed this fantastic soft fund. Uh, some would say it was the model for Abu Dhabi and Abu Dhabi Investment Authority. 
But uh, you're not sitting on your laurels, I take it, especially in the role that you have. Go ahead. Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting me. Were you to form or any gas company to a renewable summit? It's not forgiven, but it's really appreciated. Um, Can you just bring that mic a little bit closer to you? Okay. Thank you. I'll do that. Um, I'd like to be a little bit on the gas story. Um, I think the enemy here is coal. Uh, the most efficient way of combating the climate change is getting rid of the coal. And the most efficient way of getting rid of coal uh, is to replace it with gas. So I think gas has a role, it has a very important role in the transition. I agree that there will be a future where, you know, way out there where it's no longer needed. But I also think we talked about the gas as a means to back up renewables. It is important while you're waiting for batteries. Batteries would happen, but in the meantime, it has the flexibility to, to cope uh, with the intermittency. So yes, uh, I do think gas is important in this uh, transition. Then, um, I also think there's a long-term perspective for gas. Because we already mentioned hydrogen, there's two ways of producing hydrogen. There's electrolysis, using a lot of energy, um, clean energy, or you can actually split the natural gas into hydrogen and CO2. Um, then you need a means to store the CO2, but if you have established a position for CO2 storage, you can actually transform natural gas into a clean fuel that can be used in the transport sector, it can be used in the power sector, it can be used in the uh, heat segment as well. So in such a scenario, you can have gas even in a zero carbon future. Good. Uh, I wanted to follow up with this group before we bring in our ministers. And Francesco, I'd like to have you intervene as well. But I have a question. Uh, you see Silicon Valley with the influences had on the technology sector has gravitated to MIT when I think uh, of uh, the biotech sector around uh, San Diego or northern San Diego in California. Uh, you see it in Cambridge develop. Uh, uh, maybe perhaps you can jump in on this as well. What, what is the center? What is the, where is the innovation? Uh, in renewables. Where, where is the brain trust pulling in the money for the next generation? And don't identify your money as the, as the brain trust of that. But I'd love to hear, where is the money gravitating? Where, where are the good ideas coming from in renewables? Or is this a shared space? Uh, I can clearly say it's not coming from us. Uh, So you're not venturing into this area to set up uh, uh, 
investment arms and the JVs and this. No, we, we're doing a lot of that, but we're not investing because there's already a lot of people investing in that. Thing. What we do is we, we we place ourselves in these hubs. We talk to the innovators. We talk to the venture to the um, startups. We have alliance with venture capitals, and they invest in those that we think make sense. Our role is the forum. Find out what makes sense. Bring it to the market the fastest and, and the most efficient way possible, and share it with everybody else. We strongly believe that innovation is needed in order for renewables as a whole to be competitive with other forms, with other forms of energy. That's the real competition. So, if we find something that makes uh, renewable energy cheaper and we keep it to ourselves. We define the purpose. If we will never, if, even if we are a big company, we will never be big enough to really make a change. We need to share with energy and everybody else. Together, we can make a change. Good. Please. And then, Boris, I want to come back to you one more time. I'd love to say it's coming from us, but unfortunately, it's not either coming from us. I agree with Francesco, it's from the manufacturing. But, you know, just, just look at how things have changed. When you interviewed me four years ago, I knew you were looking at me at the end of the day. Yeah, it's very polished, but you know, this is not your just so made itself. I didn't say you're very polished. <laughs> <laughs> I actually said you're very good at it. But but I wanted you to listen to our colleagues from the private sector because what you hear is what Kerry was saying about innovation. <coughs> One of the hardware is really very true. It's, in, it's incredible and it's coming from all over the place. And what we have to make sure is that there's a right hand marketplace, so the race to the top is very clear. And it's accessible to everybody because then it's how transformation uh, begins to happen. But I think that's also remember it's not just innovation in technology, it's also innovation in policy, it's innovation in certain mechanisms. When we when we looked at the Northern European model and the Nordic power in particular, and how cross-border electric trade was happening. We started the initiative with the African countries for the Clean Energy Corridor. And this is the vision of massive renewable resources in the Bitcoin area. If we are able to create interconnections, a regulated electricity market with transparency for investors and clear regulatory frameworks, which allows for this trade, you can start to access the kind of financing for African power development that you would never have told me before because the market finally is there to allow large scale capital to come to the table. So that's one area of innovation also we have to speak about. But the other is, you know, I, I was very impressed once when I visited uh, Boris's uh, transmission group. And he makes a big thing about saying, I don't need uh, storage. And he does it. He's got 45% of variable renewables. He weathered the eclipse over northern Germany. Remember, it was almost a total eclipse. And everybody was uh, barricading their houses and buying food, making that everything in the end. And nothing happened. He, he managed smooth uh, uh, management of the eclipse. He has market instruments he uses. He has cross border relations that he uses. He has other technology mechanisms and technologies that he uses. So, you know, we are able to manage these kind of things. And that's all the innovation. So it is not only that the cost of technology is coming, it's not only that we're having innovation in hardware and new types of technologies that are coming to the market, it's our policy innovation that will become the real change also. Yeah, in fact, it's a question I wanted to, to raise. Perhaps uh, the panel can jump in and we'll take all, uh, all hands on this. How about non-technology innovation? You touched it on it briefly. When we think of innovation, we think of products that Francesco is suggesting. Uh, the GEs and the Siemens of the world that are coming through. What would you like to see before we bring in our, our uh, ministerial panel here in terms of non-technology innovation? How do we think out of the box to support the hardware, if you will, uh, when it comes to innovation? Please, go ahead. Okay. If I can propose something, is uh, like one of the good things in Europe is, is, is regional cooperation, but it's yes, all corporate people <coughs> to, to develop things. Uh, what we see, and, and there are good examples in Europe, where, where policy makers sit together with regulators, with TSOs and the industry in the same room for many hours to discuss and develop and agree upon a way forward. 
It's not, it's not enough that TSOs sit together or regulators sit together. They have to be in the same room, the industry, the full industry, and develop and come up with good solutions, clear solutions for the issues at hand. So if we have, have more of that, then we then must welcome the regulators, policymakers, TSOs, industry, sit together, develop long term issues and, and plans for the future. That would be a gift for society. Great. I, I don't want to go sales and PDs. We need to set up the uh, acronyms here. Uh, you know, people don't understand this outside your space. No, I'm not saying that's a criticism to you. But I think there's an education that is, needs to take place outside this room. No, but not before this weekend. <laughs> Which is good. But I, I think we need to get this more to the common vernacular for the world to understand the innovation that's taking place. In case it's models. What we can learn from Silicon Valley is that a tiny company can become a $600 billion company in less than a generation. We are right now in this position with these five revolutions I mentioned. But the good news is that it's not just business models, it's changing people's lives. The model, for instance, uh, straight out of Brussels by 2030 with full autonomous uh, uh, and clean vehicles. We're reducing by 100% emissions we're reducing by half the length of uh, a route from sort of Brussels to the central Brussels. We're reducing by a factor of six the cost of a point to point drive uh, uh, the vehicle in this case on this uh, shared vehicle. What I'm saying is that if we combine these technologies and the talent of our companies, and most importantly, the public sector vision of the common good, if all of this would require planning and regulation. change people's lives everywhere, massively. And this is what we have had of our, and which is, as far as I'm concerned, a very much different process. Thank you for that.